Welcome to Afro Comic Con. Uh, this panel is called the Producers of TV and Film, and this is for the virtual 2020 event. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, please consider don donating to the Afro Comic Con slash uh, Moonshot Junior program, uh, where funds uh, uh, will funds go to young girls of color uh, to go through a 12 month program where they will learn tech skills, innovation, uh, product development, and entrepreneurial skills. Please go to afrocomiccon.org and make your donation today. Now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, as I said this before, this is the producers of TV and film. I would like to introduce you to my panel. Uh, with me today is Mr. Monty Ross. Hello, hey. Monty. How hey. are you doing? All right, all right. Quick, quick little intro. What have you done in the world of TV and film, sir? Uh, thanks for having me here, and uh, really excited to be here in the world of film and television. I have, uh, I'm primarily known as, as the guy who was uh, Spike Lee's uh, first producer, uh, and with that came, you know, a myriad of, of many projects, uh, the ranging from Do the Right Thing, Mo Better Blues, She's Got to Have It. And a lot of people don't know, I was also in Spike's thesis film, Joe's Best Eye Barbershop, We Cut Heads, uh, as a lead actor. And uh, I became vice president of production and went on and did a number of things. Also, I got a chance to do a story on Adam Clayton Powell Jr., one of the foremost congressmen and ministers uh, out of Harlem, New York. Uh, and now I've got a chance to work with like many, many young folks who are doing excellent work, you know, uh, with Sharnice Fox, Wes Miller, uh, Menelik Mumba, Lamumba, uh, and we're here at Solidify Productions. And, and, and not to mention, we are here in Richmond, Virginia, uh, growing. We've completed eight films now in a period of uh, the last four years, and uh, we're continuing to growing a lot of opportunities. BK Fulton uh, is our founder and CEO, and he makes things happen and, and, and in a much big way. And uh, basically, I love what I do. I right. have tried to be in corporate America, just didn't work. <laughs> but let's, well, while you're sitting here, like talking about the past, how about let's get to the rest of the panel? How about Mr. Marcus King is now here to join us as well, too. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, how you doing, Arash? Thank you. Pleasure to meet you, Marcus. So, what TV and film have you produced uh, for us to all to know? Well, I don't know if anyone would know because it's so old, but I started my career actually at Showtime at the Apollo. Oh, 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 how dare so you put my name television Showtime. Show I worked with the Sutton family and Don Weiner, and that was like my first cutting of my teeth in right there in Harlem. Um, wow. And I went on to get into the sitcom business um, from television. I did a show called Hanging with Mr. Cooper, which was my first foray. And yes. I want to do some other shows that didn't last as long, uh, but the Jamie Foxx show, we had a pretty good run with that one. And just a lot of comedy specials and festivals and really I uh, dwelled in the comedy business. And that business actually took me to film and music and even radio. So, um, you know, I've done a myriad of things. I feel like I'm a jack of all trades. Some knew me as a manager and then uh, when the gray hair started to overcome me, yeah. Um, yeah, I gave up the manager hat and just became producing partners because you get fewer grays with yeah. you your phone off. So um, that's what I uh, that's what I've done in a, in a snapshot, and I, I won't eat up anybody else's time. No, that's plenty. And thank you for hanging with Mrs. Uh, Mr. Cooper. I love basketball and I love that show very much. Mm -hmm. So thank you for producing that. Also with us in the panel today is uh, Mule Case. How are you today? You are yes, Yule, Yule, Yule Case, like Yule Kai. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be back doing another panel at uh, Afro Comic Con. I think this is my third year oh, or something, oh, there you or third go. time. Take, yeah, take, yeah. Take it over, take it over. <laughs> no, no. Um, I'm a uh, writer, director, producer. I, uh, in the kind of Comic-Con world, people knew me from the show Heroes uh, on, on NBC. And I was the um, 
producer uh, who made all the kind of interactive content. I was the first person kind of doing that in that in that in that space, and we made their first live action web series, wrote some of the comic books, and created the first interactive graphic novel for them and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But uh, my background as a writer and uh, writer, director, and producer, you know, I came out here originally. Uh, somebody was mentioning comedy. I came out here originally with Robert Townsend is how I mm. came to Los Angeles. And, um, and then I, I worked with Robert off and on for, for a number of years and worked on the uh, Parenthood series with him as, as well. And then I worked a long time also with uh, Mr. Sidney Poitier and Sidney, um, Sydney starred in a movie I, I, I wrote a long time ago with he and Felicia Rashad called Free of Eden. And so Sydney was kind of my mentor and really still set the standard of the experience that of, of a wonderful working experience just with a kind of an iconic figure. And through him, obviously, met a lot of, uh, met a lot of other uh, people. Uh, my company behind the billboard uh, is a, we do a lot of, development and international co-production and i've had the good fortune to kind of live and travel mm -hmm. around the uh world and one of one of the projects i'm currently doing i'm doing james baldwin in paris which is kind mm -hmm. of a u.s mm -hmm. french uk mm -hmm. co-production mm -hmm. and then i'm also doing kind of interesting because you have a james baldwin book right behind yes you. yeah yeah because i just had to turn mm -hmm. stuff in i'm uh, i've been yes. living in 1948 <laughs> to 50 Paris for the past year, uh, and also we have a um, our, uh, we have a animated series called uh, Future X, which is an Afrofuturistic animated uh, show that's uh, mm -hmm. that we're doing a panel on developing the animated series from A to Z, and so that's mm -hmm. kind of working its way. Uh, right now, I'm doing that with um, Maya Williams, who's a uh, sister who had um she was out of the whole kind of matt granig and futurama camp and she was actually a producer back on fresh prince of bel-air way back mm. in the in the day mm. and we mm. actually both happen to be from the bay area where mm. afro comic-con is is uh born it was a nice chance to get to try to work together uh uh on, on something so future nice. is primarily what i'm up to right now mm. Very nice. And, okay. and of course, we have to finish off our panel with Mr. Rodney Barnes. Hello, Rodney. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yes. Uh, please tell us uh, what projects have you worked on in TV and film? Uh, mostly television. Uh, I started as a writer producer on My Wife and Kids for ABC, uh, Everybody Hates Chris, uh, The Boondocks, uh, Wu Tang and American Saga, more recently, American Gods, uh, Vinyl for HBO. Um, what else? A bunch of other sitcoms in between and other things. I'm currently working at HBO on a Lakers uh, scripted drama. Mm -hmm. That should hopefully drop next year. Um, I'm doing a mini series on Tiger Woods. Um, mm -hmm. I have a movie at New Regency. I'm writing and producing uh, two series at HBO Max that I'm writing and producing, um, and a bunch of comic books. And <laughs> that's nice. About if you it. if you finish mm -hmm. your comic books, send them over to me, and I have Will no do. problem reviewing them <laughs> and letting people know where to get your books and everything Will too. Do. We'll Let's do. get things started, everyone. Uh, I guess we'll start with Monty and work our way down um, with uh, Yule. Uh, how old were you when you guys first started, and was it a production position that you guys got, or was it something else? Monty, let's start with you. Uh, we started right in college, and this is right around the time that uh, many, because I went to the HBCU, I went to, uh, I graduated from uh, Clark College, which is now Clark Atlanta University, but I, uh, uh, and this is Clark was one of the one of the first universities, African American universities, to have a mass communications department. So this was right around the time when that became, you know, very very popular. And you know, the fact that you could actually major in film or or have a career in journalism was just very exciting to many of us. And so Spike took his classes there. I took classes there. And, and what college was this again? So everyone knows. Oh, oh the college uh, Clark. It's, today is Clark Atlanta University. 
Okay. Uh, it, it merged with the graduate school there uh, and um, back in 88, but it was Clark College back in the day. And uh, the interesting thing about, about all of that was I was, I was an actor. So I, I spent 99% of my time acting, but my buddies happened to be, you know, Samuel L. Jackson, uh, <laughs> his wife, his wife, uh, back then she was a girlfriend, Latanya Richardson, uh, Kenny Leon, who was one of our, one of our <laughs> former, uh, directors for uh, film and theater. He was one of my buddies. Uh, and then on weekends, well, summer breaks, spring breaks, uh, Angela Bassett, uh, who was mm -hmm. dating Kenny at the time would come up and hang out. So this was all pre anything, you know, but that was, that was, it was, it was so interesting um, about that, but Spike would come to the theater and watch us do plays and he was taking meticulous notes and, and nobody knew that he was taking notes. Uh, and so that was that was the uh, that was the, that was the era. That was the era, and you know I think that was like mid seventies, going into the eighties. And you know we started on eight millimeter film, right? Uh, figured out eight millimeter film, went to sixteen, eventually get to thirty five, and then you know work our way through the industry. So uh, the big break happened. I, I gave up acting and went behind the scenes, and, <laughs> and I was production supervisor on She's Got to Have It. And uh, that was the film where Spike and I worked together really, really well. He handled all the creative. I handled all the you know, business decisions. And we got the film made in 12 days. And uh, it helped launch our career. But I would say we were like, what, 26, 27, around there. And that's, so that, that's, when it, uh, that's, that's when it started. And I, I must say, even today, she's got to have it. You know, I still get a royalty check from from She's Gotta Have It. And that was, that was the first one that just, you know, that broke through. But again, I always thank Chris Blackwell. Chris Blackwell, you know, a music impresario who had mm -hmm. Island Records, uh, reggae music, uh, Bob Marley. Uh, he started Island Pictures. But from that one film, uh, any class that I teach, I always teach that to students because it, it, it has proven to weather the storm throughout all the years. Netflix picked it up that uh, for uh, two seasons, two seasons. So uh, yeah, that was it. We were in our we were in our twenties, man, and you know, trying to figure it out. And you know, uh, when we finally did, she's got to have it. That was the film that uh, helped us launch our career. Nice, Marcus. How old were you when you first started, and were you a producer or was it a different position? How old was I, sir? How old were you? <laughs> I was I was eight years old. And uh, at the young age of eight years old, I was, uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I don't remember yes. how old I was, but I started in the comedy business in the Bay Area, Yule. And oh. I'm, actually, I'm actually in the Bay Area, and I, I got to be more specific, in, in Oakland, California, mm. I started, uh, producing comedy shows, and that kind of morphed into my television experience and the Apollo Theater gave me a real um, crash course on what live television was. So I, young, I learned that right as I was coming out of the comedy experience. And um, I got a taste of variety and what that mm -hmm. felt like. Mm -hmm. um, and an and idea of what live television was and how to kind of shoot and literally shoot or get shot kind of on the run. <laughs> <laughs> And from there, I went into sitcoms because I, I managed um, actors, comedians that, um, that were at that time in the mid 80s, early 90s, sitcom, uh, stand up comedy to sitcom was the thing, was the transition, mm -hmm. was the success story. Um, so I learned, I cut my producing teeth at Warner Brothers, where we did the show Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Um, and I learned around a lot of uh, pretty good producers, I think, from the Bickley Warren camp and, you know, what we were doing there. And that was kind of cool. And then I kind of learned how to do my own thing and start, um, you know, like like uh, young Rodney Barnes there, you know, did an overall deal at Warner Brothers and start bringing in some of my own shows. One of those shows was the Jamie Foxx show, because at that time I represented Jamie Foxx. And I have to say this for the record, we had a deal at NBC, but some executive at NBC said Jamie Foxx wasn't a star. And, yeah. and look at him now, he's about to do a second Spider-Man movie. Look yeah, who's laughing now. Yeah, they're out of a job. 
So uh, yeah. politely took that deal over to uh, to Warner Brothers, and we did some years on that show um, that was fun. And I did a lot of shows, a lot of HBO specials and stand up specials in between. I did a comedy festival, and I'm very familiar with Clark College and their uh, media mm -hmm. uh, film department because when we would do our Laugh of Palooza comedy festival, we would base it in Atlanta, and mm -hmm. we'd all seminars and the only media studies program there was Clark College and all the other colleges kind of uh, kind of morph around what's happening there and down mm -hmm. in that library media uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, we would do all our seminars for the kids there so yeah. that was a great experience doing that festival that we did for 14 years at wow. different and we would wow. we would uh, showcase the uh, we would call it the uh, the pro show on different networks from HBO to God, Showtime, Comedy Central. So we sold the show a few times to a few people and we were able to make a lot of young comedians that you guys probably know now from the Kevin Hart's and the Nick Cannon's and the Chris Tucker's and I could just keep going on and on. Um, right. But at that time we wanted to be a parallel to what was happening at the Montreal Comedy Festival. Mm. Um, mm. and. And, and we kind of had a, had a void, especially with African-American stand-ups, because they didn't get that opportunity to go up to Montreal and show the networks their thing. Um, and what's kind of funny to me um, is that when we told all the agencies and network execs, hey, we're doing this big festival and you have to come to Atlanta, they used to tell me, do we have to go way down to Atlanta? And <laughs> Look how things have changed. So uh, it's pretty amazing how things have changed. And that kind of got me into uh, more film business, especially representing Jamie Foxx at that time, um, where we were really trying to kind of tell some stories on the film side and find some good directors to work with. So we we're fortunate enough to get that done and then uh, ease our music into some of the films because. Uh, these big time music producers don't understand the value. Maybe they do now that the record business is gone, but the value of immersing your music through moving picture that sustains music way beyond, you know, uh, radio and record sales. So now they're getting it now because you see these big producers coming in in television and film. So I think the industry is changing in a pandemic way all across the board and we'll see where it ends up. And Rodney, how yeah. old were you when you started, and what was your first project that you worked on? Uh, late teens, early 20s. I was a student at Howard University, and mm -hmm. I was working on, as a production assistant, on movies that would come to the area and do glamour shots. And eventually, it led me to Virginia, where I worked on a movie, Major Pain, and I met Damon Wayans. And after a couple of days, it's like we were the only brothers there. So... <laughs> <laughs> we uh, ended up talking, and he just said, uh, "What do you want to do in the business? It can't just be doing this." And I said, "No, I want to be a product. I want to be a writer." Right. And so for the next two years, he let me follow him around the country, sleep in my car, and work on his movies, and which led me to L.A. I worked on a movie, wow. Bulletproof. I'm actually in that movie about the rape Adam Sandler, and. Um, Damon said, <laughs> you look familiar now. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, Damon said, you know, this commuting, because I was commuting from Maryland to California. Like, I would, wow. he called me on a Thursday and said, if you can be here by Monday, you got a job. Mm. So, driving said, or flying? No, I was driving. I would take three days. Uh, wow. I didn't wow. sleep. And so he said that uh, after Bulletproof, he said, you know, if you really want to be a writer in Hollywood, this commute thing, it's not gonna work. You're gonna have to move here, and you know. But I was afraid because I didn't know anybody. But eventually, I packed up my stuff, came to LA, lived in my car for like eight months, um, started working on other movies in the area. Worked on Blade and the Rush Hour movies and a few other things. And then ultimately, um, Damon had to show my wife and kids, mm -hmm. and he gave me a shot. He said, "I'll give you one day as a punch up writer," and I just kept coming back and. Eventually, they gave me a deal, and it all sort of worked out from there. Yes, wow. congratulations! That was mm -hmm. a, what is it? Uh, six, seven seasons for for uh, yeah. that show? 
We did six seasons. Uh, we could have had a seventh. That's a long story for another day. But yeah, we um, we did six seasons. We did. It was a good, I still get a check too from time to time. So there you go. <laughs> well, how old were you when you started, and what was the, your first project? Well, I started, I guess, pretty young. I grew up working as an actor as uh, as a kid, and I was on a show called up and coming which was oh kind of one of the early yeah, early uh it was the only black show on the air really at the time and mm -hmm. um and stan lathan was our main director and um uh my and a lot of people came through that show so uh that's how i met lawrence fishburne he was one of the guest stars danny glover esther roll brock peters and i was the kid in the family, I was the youngest son in the family on the show. And then mm -hmm. uh, famously my sister on the show went on to become one of the lead singers for the band In Vogue, Cindy Heron. And Robert Townsend used to be always, I think he had a mad crush on her as many did, but I went to my, we went to our prom, but, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he, and he would, I forget where I met him. He was hanging around once. This is before he was famous. And he was like, you know, I think trying to talk to Cindy, but he was always really nice to me. And I had gone off to college and ended up at, at Harvard, which was a strange long trip from my kind of uh, Berkeley, very unconventional uh, family right. upbringing. Uh, we were uh, kind of steep, kind of a, child of the black panther party essentially you know or raised in the shadow of and stuff my mom was a student at berkeley and so we, we kind of came from this kind of activist type of uh, um trail I, I would say different feel then right going from berkeley all the way to harvard it was a, it was a complete i didn't know how different it was until i mm. got there it was like you know they and they it's it's very funny because they would give kids from who either couldn't afford to go home or from foreign countries or as I like to say Berkeley was considered a foreign territory at that time in my era growing up and and so that's how I ended up with kind of this old Boston family as my kind of host family in that in that uh, scenario but so I ended up getting to Harvard making. Um, met a friend of mine who who had uh, said, hey, I remember you, kid. And this guy was, said, he said, I'm working on a film and we should be friends. And he was several years uh, older than I was. And that was Reggie Hudlin. And, okay. and then I had made a film called Shoes in college, which ended up on TV. And um, it ended up on A&E, PBS, BET. Back then, I, I don't know, I was selling it wherever they would take it. And and uh, Robert saw that Townsend had saw that, and he called me up, and I was doing a uh, I was working in documentaries and stuff at the time, and I was doing some work with Henry Hampton. I don't know if anybody remembers him. He created Eyes on the Prize, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, Robert said, "Hey, would you write something for me? I want to do something on Oscar Micheaux. and uh, he said, "If you come to LA, the first six months is on me." And I was right. like, "I was like, really? You know?" <laughs> you know? <laughs> and that's how I ended up in LA, kind of taking mm. a, a a flyer on it. You know, that that was a big gamble just to just to show up. And um, but curiously, a lot of people remembered that that show, and so there was just mm. a lot of it did make some things a little bit easier because I was too young to make any enemies back then as when I was a kid actor, you know? <laughs> and so I, that's how I started. Uh, and I'd grown up working in theater. And so I kept doing theater and still, still sometimes write plays and still am involved with, uh, with theater. Cause I think that's just a really great place for people to, uh, to start no matter what you want to do. It's a good, it's just a good place to, uh, to be. And then it's been a long winding journey um ever since hasn't always taken me the way in the route that i expected it, it, it would and um and it ebbs and flows and if you're in it for the long haul then 
Uh, that's the one main thing I learned from working with uh, Sydney with Mr. Poitier was he would always tell me, and now it finally kind of comes back. He would say, hey, the rewards are in the journey, kid. And I like, well, here's he a, <laughs> well, here's a follow-up question, and I'll start with you, uh, uh, Yule. Uh, 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 during this journey, what seems to be a little easier? Has there always been an easy path, or has there always been like that one difficult path getting to where you want to be? Uh, it's you know, it's never been the easy path. I would like to say my biggest advice is um, acting for me had come easy, and I and and I loved it. That's like my was my first love. And because it came easy, I didn't know that you could do things that were just enjoyable or that just gave you joy. And yeah. that's what I really kind of came back to. So I was like, whoa, I've got to like, you know, when I went to Harvard, I first started majoring in things that I thought I had to major in, mm -hmm. you know, because they were created suffering or something. And then I was like, no, but I like telling stories. So why don't you? You know, I wish I could go back and tell myself, just do the things that you like to do mm -hmm. because you, A, you'll be better at it mm -hmm. and you'll find more joy in it and you will be successful. So mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time, I think, trying to, you know, I, uh, you know, I've had a couple different companies and we were in the kind of indie film game for a long time, raising, you know, private mm -hmm. equity financing for indie films. And that's a fine business if you have a trust fund. Yes. You know, but <laughs> I, that's not how, I, I that's not how it works. No, six it's... years living in a basement. So I, that wasn't, you know. <laughs> so, you know, just do the things that, that, uh, you know, it's okay if something comes easy to you or that's where you find the joy, but there's, there's many paths to it as long as you are willing to kind of go with the flow. Yes. Um, yeah. Rodney, um, I take it your journey has not been easy, but would you have taken an easy route to where you've become now? No, I think um, it's almost like lifting weights, um, the free weights, like the muscles sometimes that you have to use to balance the weight. Uh, they come from the extra exertion. And I think um, mm -hmm. having the ups and downs mm -hmm. and having things not work out and having to develop the emotional endurance with hearing the word no a lot and not having mm. things go your way. I mm. think um, it creates a certain um, toughness that I think is necessary to come with the business. And um, I've been, you know, I've been doing it for a while now, you know, no Marcus from back in the day. And um, anytime you have a journey and you're still standing after a while, you know, usually those scars are the ones that build up a degree of character. So mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything that I would change. You know, I say that now, if you asked me a couple of years ago, I probably did <laughs> a lot that I changed. But for right now, you know, things are looking pretty good and uh, yeah, right. I'm happy with where I am. So, mm -hmm. but yeah. Mm -hmm. Marcus, same question, uh, similar to uh, uh, Yul, uh, what were some of your, um, which is the easy easy way? Would you take the hard way? What way would you prefer as far as being like I'm, the work that you've done? Arash, I'm not sure that there is an easy way in this game, especially for the gentlemen that are on this panel. Right. Um, when, I'm sure when we walked down whatever halls or corridors we had to walk down, we didn't see anyone that looked like us. We we have never, i put it to you like this, the four of us have never walked down a hallway together. Right. Yeah, exactly. And there's an industry sure. of, of folks who did walk down the hallway together and know each other. So, so yeah. like, like Yule, I do have, you know, my upbringing in, in Oakland was as part of the Panther Party environment. And I'll give you an example that um, people think when they see a film or they see a project eventually come out, they think, oh, yeah, it's glamorous and all of that. But for example, well, I worked on this project, Ray, and, you know, I was complaining about the time that it was taking to get to theaters and get the production going. But the producers that brought it, the project to us, they had been working on this project for 14 years. Mm -hmm. And once they told me that, I had to shut up. Yeah. I'm right. <laughs> project, as you'll talk about the Black Panther Party, uh, it's taken me 
uh, and hopefully he doesn't see this, but it's taken me four years to convince Bobby Seale, the founder, to finally tell his story. Mm, okay. Uh, mm. So we have been working on, once that four years of trust, and he's known me since I was a child, once that four years of trust dissipated, now we're cool. Now it's taken us another two or three years to find the situation that we want, and we're still in search. So mm. I don't think that there is an easy way. I think the um, adoration is when you get into the Rodney Barnes uh, area where they start shoveling money at you. There you go. There you go. <laughs> That's some reward. <laughs> or, or you have somebody like Monty Ross call you and say, hey, come speak to my class. I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> That's all you want, man. See, <laughs> uh, especially from your beginnings, were those beginnings difficult for getting some of the uh, uh, movies and films off the ground? Uh, yeah, um, like, like everyone is saying on the panel, it was very difficult, extremely difficult, and um, but I think. I think one of the one of the joys of of work, yeah, especially especially in our business, you know, whether it's the performing arts or some form of the arts. What I what I love about what I love about film is film, you get to you, you get a chance to put everyone together. So you get a chance to draw on everyone's strength. Mm -hmm. And I can see myself when I started, you know, doing more producing, uh being really like, you know, stringent and tight on the budget, right? Right. And, and everything had to line up. Everything, you know. And then uh, Wynn Thomas is one of the you know great production designers. Yeah. Pulled me to the yeah. side, and Wynn goes, "Monty, listen, listen. What you got to understand is, I know things are really tight, but we, I can really make this set answer any question as soon as the camera goes on about this character." And those little, those little, little mm. uh, uh, jewels that he began to drop, I began to then figure out that my role as a producer was to then understand how each key department person worked and what they needed. And even though we didn't have money, it was uh, creative thinking, creative mm -hmm. thinking, right? And so uh, for me, being, being around that environment, right, especially being around an Ernest Dickerson, and Ernest was always, you know, hand on his chin, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay, let me get money, money, order three of this, four of this, I'm going to get this kind of cable, blah, 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 right? And it, even though all of this is, is all micro, you know, all of this is, but at the same time to watch this whole team work. So mm -hmm. it taught me as a producer that I had to really open up and listen and really see the results that each one of the key members of the team was creating and going for. And sure enough to walk on a set and actually see like when say, you see this bed now on oh, She's Gotta Have It, that was a custom made bed on oh, She's Gotta Have It because he knew the guy, the carpenter who wanted to make something like that. So the long story short to me, to me, you know, each one of these films, all of our films and projects to me, they each have something something and to me if you're if you're totally open you know if you're totally open to learning there's always something that you can learn and enjoy about this whole entire process and you know award shows the big limousines the the all, all of that stuff is great you know when you finally start making money it's like oh my god whoo <laughs> <laughs> it's you know all of that is great but if i had to really uh, look at this journey from from hard to where it is now. I, I would have to say that learning that there's artistic integrity and in working with people who teach you more and help you really figure out those creative challenges that you have. And when you step back and look at the work and you see the work still holds up, to me, that's the that's the joy. That's the joy mm -hmm. right there. That's the joy. And then, and then the industry begins to say, hey, I want to work with you because they know you firmly understand how to bring out the best in people. Yeah. And then, and then I'm not saying it's easier, no, but the fact that the industry knows that you know how to get in there, work with folks mm -hmm. and bring out the best. 
And and at the end of the day, that's that's really you know what we can really really hope for. And and each each uh, department does their thing. You know? Well, unfortunately, someone on this panel must leave us very shortly because he has other things to do. You all, you have to like leave us. I'm very sorry about that. But yeah, uh, right before you go, practice. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much that, that's okay. But before you go, um, do you have any message you want to tell anyone when it comes to production and or film wise, production wise, anything, any positive message? Also, what projects are you working on currently that we should be looking forward to? Well, you should certainly, the Afro Comic Con crowd should certainly be looking forward to uh, Future X, which is our animated uh, uh, series that takes place in 100 years in the future in Obama land, formerly Oakland. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> after climate change has ravaged the earth and, uh, mm. you know, the heat has gone up and those with less melanin in their skin did not survive what we call the uh, melanin apocalypse or the black folks call it melapocalypse. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, arrested, man. <laughs> He's fine. So, uh, uh, so that's what I'm wor working on right now. And then James Baldwin in Paris mm. is totally on the opposite side of it. But, uh, and I'm doing that with a wonderful cinematographer who's gonna be the director named Bradford Young. Uh, who who's the first uh, black DP shouldn't have been, but the first black DP nominated for an Oscar for Arrival. Erna mm. should have had one back in the day. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, um, and so that's really uh, really uh, mm. pleased to get to work uh, work with him. And several uh, those those are the two projects that are currently really most front and center. And I would just say to anybody else. Um, don't be afraid to do all the jobs or to learn what it is. I, I, in down times, I used to, you know, I had been produced a couple indie features and then I was like, I'm broke. I started hiring myself out as a first AD. And then I, I mean, I've done first, second, all the different things just because it kept, kept me a little bit in the loop. And I knew that when I'm at the point I am now with behind the billboards and with our company, I wanted to know that I have done and you know, all those different, uh, I've worked in the art department. I was, wasn't very good. Right. <laughs> but I know what it is like to have to schlep and do that stuff and be there all those hours. And so those are, those are things they're character building, but they also give you knowledge mm -hmm. or just kind of, you know, it's it it's all useful, and that's the wonderful thing about our in, our industry is that it's a place where everything you can eventually use, yeah. and you have to embrace that. And um, I just really hope that I get to work with some of the people on this panel. And and mm. Monty, I studied you because I was working with Tommy oh. Redmond Hicks back in the day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> buck dancer, buck dancer, buck dancer, buck dancer. Yeah. And uh, we were co-writing stuff together. And any, oh, anyway, um, I'm just a big fan of everybody on this panel. And I and I uh, please get my emails, just my name, um, awesome, awesome, and Gmail. And I would really just uh, you one more sincere. thing before you go. One more thing yeah. before you go. What was the one project that you saw that you would say, "Wow, I'm finally here." I would have to say. Uh, Working on Heroes was pretty spectacular just because of Tim Kring, the creator, had brought me over there just to kind of, he said, make some stuff, you know, and that stuff then started to blow up, you know, but then to, to see how a international juggernaut hit, like to, to actually see how that happens. Yes. And to, and to see the full weight of NBC behind something, you know, I wish I had created it, but but was a part of it. Uh, but the fact yeah, that you're part and, of it makes all and, the difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it took it took one of the people on the lot. It was one of the attendants. It was a brother who used to see me come in every day, and he told me, "Oh my gosh, they painted your name on a parking spot." Yeah. And from the place on the parking spot, they had it set up that I can look at my name on that parking spot and the Hollywood sign. And at that moment I said like, oh my gosh, I think, <laughs> I think I made it <laughs> or at least feeling it. And then, yes. you know, 
Now I've been in search of that again. No, but <laughs> hey, hey, I will tell you this before you go. Comic Con, because of you, you have tons of kids to this day that constantly cosplay at all the heroes of that show. Uh, <laughs> so you know what? That Thank legacy you. will always live on. And if you go to a Comic Con, I will guarantee two or three kids dressed as one of those characters. Yeah, and very funny. My son, who I'm about to take, Echo. He was the one of the first characters I got to create for that show. Wow. He started in a comic book and then became on the show. And that was really something to, I wanted to leave at least some tiny bit of legacy for, you know, to know that, you know, if, if he so chooses, you're steeped in it. You are a comic character. Thank you. Thank guys. you. You all, you have a wonderful day. <laughs> yes. Yes. Take care. Bye bye. Okay, right. Bye bye. <laughs> Uh, let's go with uh, Marcus. Same question. Uh, when did you know that I'm final? I finally like I'm finally here. I belong here. Um, I don't. I don't know that yet. What? <laughs> I don't think you ever find that kind of comfort. I don't, at least. That mm -hmm. you know. Um, I always think I belong wherever I am because right. you know, no one put me there but God. But um, in terms of the industry. I think my first opportunity of driving on a lot, you know, that's an important mm -hmm. thing when you're not getting escorted off somewhere or chased off somewhere. You you actually, like you said, you, you see your name on that parking spot. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I felt like, okay, I can be effective here. You know, I, I, I've come a long way and struggled my way up and I learned a lot, but I spent more time trying to learn than trying to know everything because it would have been easy for me just to be positioned and leveraged into situations where, you know, because I'm somebody's manager now, you know, I get, um, I get a pass with a credit and all of that, but I never did that because I was a producer before I was a manager. Right. And, um, and it was grind. I was a concert promoter at one time. So I was a street promoter and I was a street guy first. Mm -hmm. And it was an ugly grind. It wasn't sexy. So when I actually got to drive on a lot and saw my name uh, on a on a curb, you know that was everything. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to waste that opportunity. So I became a student at that time of uh, how to produce television, so I could learn learn it inside out and know exactly you know what I wanted to do and the stories I wanted to tell. And I'm still kind of waiting for that opportunity because we have a myriad of stories to tell. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and even when Rodney and I get together, when we bump into each other, we sit there, you know, we, we might be waiting for our cars or something to, to pull up or whatever, but we, we sit there and we talk about all the stories that haven't been told. Mm -hmm. you know, I feel and, like between the three of you, there's enough stories to go around for the next 15 to 20 years, especially with, mm -hmm. with all of your journeys that you guys have gone through. Man, it's, it's not even our <laughs> it's, it's culturally, you mm -hmm. know, what's, uh, what's uh, absent in the storytelling of the fabric of not only this country, but the world. And mm -hmm. I think we have great stories to tell that um, it'll go way beyond us. So when I, mm -hmm. when I really knew I made it, when I saw my daughter's credit, my daughter's a producer mm -hmm. on the show, Jesus and Meryl. Oh, nice. And I didn't teach her anything. She gets nothing from me. But when I saw my daughter, my youngest graduate, uh, from film from Sarah Lawrence and then my oldest producing a television show and them both not needing to leverage, you know, anything that their mom or dad did and them kind of do it on their own. Mm -hmm. Then I really mm -hmm. felt I made it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a great feeling to see your kids go for like just beyond what you're capable of in a way. Correct. Yeah. I can get a better loan from them than I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rodney, like, what's some of your projects that you're most fond of? Oh, my God. Uh, I was prepared to answer the other question. Um, <laughs> most fond of? I mean, the ones that I'm working on right now, really, the Lakers. Um, when you think about the Lakers, it's we start in the 80s with the Dr. Buss, Magic Johnson, Kareem Lakers, mm. which was when I was first – into basketball like as a player and as a fan 
And so to be able to tell the story of how um, sports and media and race and culture sort of converged at the same time, um, you know, it's a it, it's a rare opportunity to get a lot of different of a lot of different interests together in one show. Um, it's a, it's an honor to be able to be working on it. So I'd say that, I mean, I dig Tiger Woods as well. Uh, his father was certainly a character and being able to talk about the forties and fifties and race during Kansas in that period of time. And I mean, virtually everything that I'm working on right now, there's a degree of um, an emotional connection to it. And I think if there's anything that I appreciate from having gone through this journey, like I've done a lot of sh jobs I didn't want to have to do in order to make ends meet and to finally be in a place where everything I'm sort of involved in are things that I either chose or, you know, they were chosen with me in mind so that um, I feel more connected to the material than I ever have. So as a writer, I think my best work comes from when I'm emotionally connected to the material more so than if I'm doing it because I got to keep the lights on. And fortunately that's where I am at the moment. Hey, awesome. let's, let's keep those, let's keep those lights on. Uh, we with, gotta keep uh, on. I got kids. Yes. Yeah. You got <laughs> uh, uh, Monty, you've probably seen twice as much as what everyone else has seen. Everything is this the time for more true story writing, true storytelling? Let's just say from the fifties, from the sixties, and from the seventies up until today's, um, up until today. Um, where where does current stories lie? Um, I, I say, uh, as far as story, story to me always is, is, a, is a, from a, a place of truth, uh, where writers aren't afraid to pull back mm -hmm. and expose, you know, and they, they are afraid, they're not afraid to tell, you know, a truth or to lead us toward a path, you know, of truth. Um, and it's, it's, it's just very evident when you, when you, when you watch movies, you know, uh, like Christopher Nolan. Mm -hmm. Okay. But me and Tenet, I wanted right. to like it more. I wanted to like it more, especially doing COVID-19. Okay. Uh, okay. I wanted to like it more. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, Understood. But, but on the other on the flip side, I'm still waiting for season four of Ozark at this particular time, you know. And uh, one of the reasons why, is, you know, I can't, you know, I'm, it's 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 COVID nineteen. I need I need so I need to connect. You know, I'm, I watch. You need a broad, You need a stronger I, connection, and I, you're not feeling that stronger yeah, connection because, because we left the way we left Ozark. I'm we gotta go. We, you know, I, come on Netflix. <laughs> I love everything that you're doing. But I'm just I'm just simply saying that all that to say is that there's a lot of stuff out there, and, and you know every writer who sits down to write, you know, of course they're going for their truth. But certain things resonate, certain writers resonate, uh, be, just because they have they have something to say. You know, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we are lost on right now, especially in our art and our culture, well, if it's good for this particular artist, oh, then it's good for everyone else, and. And, and, and give me one of those and give me one of those because that's hot right now as opposed to finding the common ground with, of what works based on truth. Right. And we're afraid of, we're afraid of, we're afraid of, it seems like the, uh, sometimes our industry gets really afraid of that and things get to be cookie cutter and, and that sort of thing. And, and to me, you know, that, that's one of the fortunate things. I'm really happy I got a chance to come up through the the, you know, that independent era when independent film was accepted, you know, when, when, you know, you could find common ground, uh, but, but, you know, you could seek a certain truth and then, and then go for it, you know, and write it. And the industry was, now I wouldn't say they were open arms, but they were more receptive to it than what we have now. So I would say like, everyone's trying to figure out how to be the next thing, the next big thing, as opposed to taking that journey to find what works and connect well yeah, let me ask connect. you and, and then eventually eventually it, it does pay off you know and um and, and so the, like i said to, to me i'm always you know i can i can i'll give you the first three pages if somebody says it says oh mr ross would you read my stuff read my stuff and i'm like 
Ooh, you know, and I said, what? Well, send me the first 10 pages. And if the first 10 pages hits me and knocks me out, I want to read the rest. And sometimes I get to page three and I'm like, oh man, okay. And I have, I'm sorry I had to tell the person it just didn't take me past that, you know. But whenever there's that writer who, who I can see they have really taken the time to master their craft, and, and and present a degree of truth. Oh man, I get excited about that, and and I want to continue to work with the writer, and I want to make sure you know that that we can go in and actually get it, you know, produced. So that's, I mean, that, that may be old school, but I think it's the it's, it's the best school, you know, because a lot of times when you put these things down and you, you're sacrificing a lot of your time and your life. And you know, time is something that's very, 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 very precious. You know, and especially going forward uh, with theaters not being around like they used to be. <laughs> so, so now it's really critical. <laughs> you yeah, know, you guys, you work guys, with someone, both, you know what I mean. <laughs> both, both you and Marcus both says uh, like you guys are looking forward to doing stuff on streaming sites. Is is this like the new way to go? Is because theaters are so. They're like no one's going to go into movie theaters for quite a while. Is the new focus now on streaming services? Yeah, I mean, I, I was, I was, I would say yes. I would, I would, I would, I would say yes. Um, but also, I would also like to say for emerging writers, um, learn to write for an audience. Learn to really, and, and I mean, you know, don't forget about yourself in that in that mix. But I think one of the things is learning, it, there's so many, there's a lot of avenues right now. Learn to write, you know, and, and I, I think that's what's missing. I think one of the parts that's missing is that everything always winds up on your watch, everything winds up on a cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, when we came up, you know, everything was on a huge screen. So you could, you, you could see okay. what worked and what didn't work, you know, sitting in that audience, you know, and then sitting behind you know, that, that, that audience, especially on the research screening, you know, you know, we thought we was hot stuff. And then we went to Paramus, New Jersey for the screening of uh, school days. And some of the audience, man, take that shit out. <laughs> <laughs> Spike, take that shit out. <laughs> and Spike was mad, you know, he said, man, this is, man, man. I said, Spike, shh, shh, shh. come on, man. Come on, we gotta take it, you know. <laughs> We gotta, we gotta be able to let the audience, you know, have that. So, and, and sure enough, man, when it got down to the, to the twenty people, you know, to really do, give you the feedback, man, you know, that same dude was like, I don't, I don't even know if Spike is here now, but I want to tell him. When it got to this part of the movie, and that scene came up, he need to take that shit out. <laughs> <laughs> and Spike got all upset. And, I said, Spike, come on, man. No, man, I gotta say something. <laughs> and uh, but I'm just saying, I, I, sometimes I think that cultural exchange is, is is missing. But it teaches you, it teaches you um, what works and what doesn't work. Because at the end of the day, you're learning, you're learning to work with that audience as well. And the fact that they got to see it on this huge screen. You know, and it communicates a completely different message. I think a, a, a large screen television is great. Cell phones are great. Laptops are great. But there's nothing like that experience of seeing a movie, you know, in a theater to give you a whole different experience about, you know, the work that you've created. Nice. Um, Rodney, since you have a background in comic books and everything, um, we've seen two major rises and it came to film culture, one being Creed, and the next one being Black Panther. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that um, with this change happening, is this going to continue to happen, or are we looking at because of Black Panther, this is now going to be a like a mini one-off? We'll say um, it's hard to say. I mean, I think I remember after Black Panther, um, after Black Panther did so well, got a lot of calls about. Um, you know, man, superheroes are going to be the thing. Black superheroes. Do you have a black superhero? And I think as long as people outside of the culture are evaluating what our culture wants or is interested in, whether superheroes or horror or anything, it makes it really, really tough to um, make the inroads that I think um, to capitalize off the moment as greatly as we could. Um I think the more executives we get 
of us that are mm -hmm. there and people who really understand the nuance and specificity of what African-American culture and people of color culture is, I think that's when you'll get the steady stream of, uh, of those types of movies there. I think as long as we still have to filter our experience through people who really don't understand our experience, it's going to be hit or miss. You know, every once in a while, you're going to get a thing that, you know, Ryan Coogler is a craftsman and I really respect his work. So, you know, the fact that he did those two films, I'm not surprised that they did well. But I think through every process, every step of the process, um, you have to have people who really understand what we spark to, what matters to us. Um, and until we get that across the board, I think it's really, really hard to say that this is the moment that it's going to explode because it's not dependent upon just primarily us. Um, and I think to a lesser or greater degrees, we have to say we have to have a say in the way a story is executed. Um, I know just working in television for so long, many times when it comes to specificity in African American culture, I've had to like do battle with executives and end up in a position where we make a compromise that still is unsettling in the end when you see it on TV. And even if people dig it, you say, yeah, but if, if you could have only seen what it would have been had I not have to put this note in or have not have to do this thing. So to me, the true evolution is when the power makers and the people, the green lighters are closer to when diversity hits that area. I think that's when I think things will become more of an even playing field and you get more of those types of films. So, so sooner or later, like, even though this is progress, number one, this can mm -hmm. continue to be stronger and with deny. a longer longevity. No, of course. Yeah, you, you can't, you can't deny that, you know, those steps were taken that, you know, anytime you make something that's undeniable, uh, undeniably great, um, that's a new voice and a new thing, uh, you can't just dismiss it. So I, I think, um, the opportunity is there to continuously do it again. I'm not saying there's not any hope. I'm just saying that across the board for it to become a regular thing, we have to have us in the mix of the decision makers and not just the people coming to the table saying, can we please make a thing or would you please fund our thing? And then somehow have to make a compromise to how it's executed. True. But unfortunately, well, we're gonna have to come to an end with this. Guys, we'll start with Marcus, then Rodney, we'll end with Monty. Monty, where can we find you and how can we continue this conversation? And what projects are you working on next? Um, you can find me at, uh, it's right here, uh, www.solidify.com. Uh, I'm president of production there. Uh, we've been very fortunate. We've got eight films that we've completed uh, over these last you know, four years. And uh, I think I think that my 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 final statement is is, is Rodney, you hit it definitely on the head. Is that uh, our culture uh, that filter? <laughs> if we can, if we can get that filter down <laughs> and hold it down, I just really believe that uh, we we could really tell some very very tell stories the way. Uh, our stories the way they need to be told in a way that's that's refreshing and commercial too and mm -hmm. very commercial at the same time and uh, but but by having that charge by having that uh, and that and that's a part of all everyone on this panel uh, their legacies you know all of their legacies to me just really say like you know uh, kids you know one form or another i know we all grew i know i did i grew up on those karate movies <laughs> you know everybody was kung fu fighting i grew up on you know the black exploitation era i grew up yep. in the, so I, I grew up you know you know watching lady sings the blues and, and, and watching all of that all of that come together and for me as a kid from omaha nebraska it all came together and i said man you know that's 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 that is so beautiful when you can really express yourself and present it, uh, you know, you know, to America in a way that they say, like, they nod their heads and they begin to get it. So, uh, lots of stuff going on. Uh, looking forward to some other great things happening. Thanks for having me here on the panel, man. And I'll turn it over to these two gentlemen right here. Yes, um, Rodney, where can awesome. we find you, and what projects are you working on next? 
Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at the Rodney Barnes. Uh, I'm doing a Tiger Woods mini series, the Lakers scripted series, and um, a whole bunch of comic books and other things. Uh, you'll probably find me at Marcus King's house because that's the yeah. most, that's the hottest place to be. You want to have a good time. Now, everybody listening, if you ever want to have a good time, you want to hang with Marcus King. You don't do all of that promoting and not know how to have a party. So Marcus King's house is where, if not Twitter. Marcus King's house. <laughs> all right, all right. And head up on the West Coast to go to Marcus King's house. Marcus, yes. where uh, where can we find you, and what projects are you working on next? Well, let me say this. Um, I don't really have a way, and I don't really want to be found, but if uh -oh. you are trying to find me, um, this is that was for the IRS, but if you <laughs> are trying to find me, you can find me on Instagram, probably. Download, I mean, uh, what is it? DM me. Uh, at Marcus King 2644. But I, I do want to say this about Black Panther because uh, Ryan Coogler is a fellow Oaklander. So I got I to gotta lift him up. <laughs> if we pay attention to that film, uh, and I was talking about, and you was talking about this as well, the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. That was a story about the Black Panther Party. If you know that one character wanted to work with a political system and another character wanted to tear it down. Right. And it, emanated from Oakland, just like the Panther Party. So I, I was very happy to see a lot of people that don't look like us uh, intrigued and, and, and entertained by a story they didn't quite understand. Yeah. If you understand that story and if you know your history, then you'll tie, he tied that into a Marvel film uh, geniusly to me. So mm. I'm happy that that those stories are getting told and hopefully we can tell some of the other stories because it's the fabric to uh, our culture and who we are in this country. All right. So One more question for you guys before we all go. Me as a first generation born and raised here, what is one movie that you all recommend me to watch to, to understand the culture? Marcus, let's start with you. Oh, don't start with me. Yeah, I'm glad it started with you. Uh, I don't know if, if I don't think this is their one film. I don't think you know. I love some films at at different time periods. Like, mm -hmm. tell me when Mo Better Blues came out. Okay, Mo, okay, Mo Better Blues. Video, you know, yeah. I was bleak, bleak. I was bleak all day. You know, <laughs> I jazz. I loved it. I loved the music form. I love the the uh, story of the Miles Davis. Uh, 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 I can't think of the other. Uh, no, Shadow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Shadow. Yeah. And, Shadow, and, Shadow and, and Bleak. You know Shadow and Bleak. Right. Go on that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, if you know your history between the sax and the, and the trumpet, it was always a battling dynamic in bands like that, and they had to split off and do their own thing. So you want to find, you want to kind of march through history and not look at like one film to point to. Just look at directors and how they storytell. Okay. Yeah. Rodney, what film would I'm you gonna recommend? Go, yeah, I'm going to go in the honor of Monty Ross. I'm going to say always do the right thing. So <laughs> do the right thing. I'm going to stay in that vein because, you know, it had everything. You know, the writing was on point, the cinematography, the acting. It was... Um, you know, it was everything that you want a great kicks. film to be. If I remember correctly, yeah. it was all about the sneakers. <laughs> yeah, but it was everything that a great film should be. So yeah. I'm going to go. That's going to be my recommendation. Do the right thing. Monty. I'm, I'm, I'm going to piggyback that and say uh, when it comes to race and, and, and what's going on, I would say do, do the right thing is, 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 is that film. Uh, you know, and... You know, and just look, one last thing. The thing about Spike's writing style back then was uh, Spike would conceive, of a, conceive the idea, think about the idea, uh, and then go do as much research as possible, get these three by five cards and write out the scenes <laughs> that he wanted to see in the film, neatly arrange those cards, and then hand write the script, right? So he hand wrote, do the right thing, literally. And then he turned it in and it got typed, uh, that sort of thing. But I, but I say that one of the things Spike always said, he said, man, I never, I just want black people to talk. I want right. them to leave the theater and talk about what the heck is going on. And he said, I don't know what the end is. I don't know how to correct the situation that's going on. I just want them to talk. And so uh, 
And so that became, that became, you know, our mission was, okay, for me it was, okay, that's what you want to say as an artist? You just want, to, want people to have a great conversation? Okay, fine, let, let's go. And so that was, a, that was the motivation and the passion behind uh, a lot of that early work, you know, of, 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 uh, of Spike. But I would say do the right thing is your movie when it's talking about race and race relations in this country. Well, now we know what everyone needs to get at the P their local shop uh, for Christmas, and that is a poster of Do the Right Thing. I remember as a kid growing up, almost every pizzeria in New York, if you rather, whether you were in New York City, the Bronx, in Long Island, or in Brooklyn, Queens, every single pizza shop had Do the Right Thing on there. I'd like to thank my panelists for being part of this. Uh, thank you all for being part of the producers of TV and film. Go and check them out on Twitter, social media, and on their websites. Thank you for watching Afro Comic Con Virtual Con 2020. And we will all see you all very soon. Thank you all for watching us and good night. Thank you. All right, thanks, Thank John. you very much. All, all right. right. Take it easy. Take it easy, yeah.